Let's turn that corner pantry into a beautiful butler style pantry. In this video, we're going to show you how to build, install and finish a wooden countertop with a faux front to make it look like it's inches thick. The fourth step in building a base cabinet. First, you need to design and plan your countertop. Choosing the best type of wood for your wooden countertop is a tricky thing to do. The first thing to consider is whether or not the wood fits your kitchen's design and feel. You'll also need to consider the hardness and durability of the wood and how you're going to use the countertop. Will it be in the kitchen? Will there be water on it? Will you use it for food preparation? Is it exposed to direct sunlight? Sun can change the color of wood over time depending on the type of wood that you use. Our favorite choices are quarter cut oak, which is what we're going to use in this project, maple, which is what we used in our previous kitchen project, walnut and cherry. Each of these types of wood has a great hardness and durability for use in a kitchen or where there's going to be food prepped. Just keep in mind that cherry will tend to deepen it to an orange color over time and maple will tend to yellow when exposed to direct sunlight. So depending on your style and your kitchen design, you can choose from many different types of wood. If you've been building a base cabinet along with us, you'll already have the width of your left side of your countertop and the right side of your countertop. They're simply the measurements F and G respectively, including the overhang desired and your baseboard width. The length of the countertops on the left and the right have also been determined. Just remember to account for both of the baseboards on either side. You can use these drawings as a reference to help. If you still don't have a plan, please don't worry. Just check out our planning guide here to find out how. We've labeled the left side of the countertop finished dimensions as CLL by CWL and the right side as CWR by CLR. So now we're going to need to calculate how many boards are needed in order to build both the left side and the right side of our corner countertop. In order to do this, we have to decide the orientation of the boards. To do this, you need to think about which side of the wood is going to be facing where. We want the face grain to be on the top and the edge grain to be on the sides. This gives it the most visually appealing look. To us, having the face grain run in the same direction on both the left and right sides of the countertop gives the most visual appeal. However, you can also choose to run them at 90 degrees to one another. Depending on the width of the boards that you choose, you'll then be able to calculate how many boards that you need for each side. You need to figure out the exact width of each board and you can either choose to have them all equal width or they can be deferring widths arranged to be visually appealing. Next, decide how to finish the front faces. How thick will the countertop look? Do you want edge grain to match on both sides like ours do? If you want to give the look that your countertop is a lot thicker than it is, we'll show you how to achieve that faux thick countertop. In order to ensure your measurements are correct, we highly recommend using a scrap piece of dummy wood and cutting it to the exact length, then planing the top edge on one side and bottom edge on the other end. And this allows you to test the measurements without damaging the wall. Then simply take your dummy piece of wood and slide it in where the countertop would sit on top of the base cabinet frame. Make sure to test in both the front and the back of the base cabinet as the walls will most likely not be straight. Also make sure to double check that the gap is not too wide to be covered either with a bead of silicone or with your tile if you're going to be tiling your wall. If you didn't make your base cabinet frames with us, just ensure that the cabinet frames are at right angles to one another. We're finished designing and planning, now we're ready to prepare our raw wood. First, we'll need to plane and joint the wood boards to create square edges and equal thickness. You can also have your boards jointed and planed at the lumber store. Just remember to have all the boards jointed on at least two sides and planed on both faces to the desired thickness. And if you don't have a table saw, just have them joint three sides. If you're using your own jointer, just continue to place your board through the jointer until it no longer has resistance. Then plane both faces of your boards to the desired thickness. If your planer has fresh blades on it, this will make it a lot easier to sand your countertop as it will create a nice smooth finish. Make sure to use a thickness gauge to check that your boards are all equal thickness. 
We then used our table saw to cut each board to the exact width. When you go to cut the length, make sure you leave an extra minimum three or four inches. This allows room for error and allows you to cut to an exact fit when it's all finished. Planning the order and orientation of the boards will allow you to achieve your desired look. Sometimes just moving one board around or flipping it the opposite direction makes all the difference. We're now ready to assemble our countertop. So first we're going to dry fit our wood boards and make sure we like the look of them. Then we're going to biscuit joint all of our boards. Remember to cut, plane, and joint an extra board to use for your faux front. Using biscuits prevents slippage while gluing your boards together. Place a pencil mark on the adjacent boards about every two feet or so. Then we like to draw a curvy line to help with alignment when we put the boards back together. This biscuit jointer is so easy to use. Just simply line up the lines that you've created with the center line on the biscuit jointer and press in. You're going to create holes on one side of each end and both sides of all the other boards. Just make sure that the biscuit jointer is lined up so that the holes are created right in the center of the width of the board. We're now ready to glue our boards together. Preparation is the key when gluing because we need to act fast and efficiently. The assembly time can be as little as five minutes, so having an extra set of hands can be really helpful. You also want to make sure to use enough glue. Using more glue and then wiping off excess is a lot easier and you'll have more success than trying to use littler amount of glue. Make sure you glue both sides where you're going to join and place glue inside the biscuit joint as well. Then ensure that you're rubbing and placing the glue all over the surface, including the sides of the biscuits. We like to place the boards on top of pipe clamps and use wood calls to keep the boards aligned. Use tuck tape to cover our wood calls. The glue will not stick to the tuck tape nor to the metal. Remember to cover your work surface to prevent glue from leaking onto it and wrecking it. Once you've got all of your boards placed together, semi-tighten your pipe clamps, ensuring not to over-tighten, and then add additional boards or calls to the top. Clamp to secure the cross braces. We like to use cabinet clamps. Add as many extra clamps as you need to ensure it's a flat surface. It's always better to over clamp than under clamp. Then promptly remove the excess glue. Fill any holes or knots with wood filler. And of course, this is a personal taste. If you do not fill the holes, you may end up with food in some of those grooves. Make sure to check the specific glue that you're using for the clamp time. Usually this can be between two to four hours, but some are even quicker. Then just make sure you give it at least 24 hours to cure before you use any power tools and put excess pressure on the joints. Gently scraping off the excess glue really helps when it comes to sanding time. Just make sure to avoid aggressive angles and have a very, very gentle angle. This makes sure that you won't scratch the wood with the scraper. To ensure that you have a flat bottom on your countertop, remove the glue from the bottom as well. As you can see, our countertop is nice and straight. Now for the fun part, we're going to build the faux front. So grab that piece that you've previously planed and jointed and cut it the width of the faux front piece, which is going to be equal to the desired overhang of your countertop. This piece is going to be added underneath your countertop. So we're going to flip it upside down, glue and clamp those two pieces together, ensuring that you use enough glue that it slightly oozes out the sides when clamped together. Double check that the alignment of the two pieces is perfectly smooth before we're going to now drill them into place. We highly recommend using a drill stop collar set. This way you can set the depth of the hole to make sure it doesn't go through the top of your countertop. Drill to the set depth going into the middle of the faux piece. Then you'll want to make sure to countersink the hole as this is going to be on the underside of the overhang of your countertop, so you don't want it to be visible at all. Then just simply place your screws into the countersunk holes every foot or so to secure your faux front. Next, we used our table saw to cut the countertop to square the ends. Remember, we are not cutting to the exact length yet. Flip it over and cut both ends to be square. 
This is why we needed that extra three or four inches minimum so that we were able to finish it perfectly. Since the faux front adds a little height, we're going to use half inch plywood to raise the underside to equal the faux front. This allows for a flat surface to secure to the base cabinet frame. Mark about every foot or so where you're going to pre-drill a hole. Then make sure to countersink the holes with your countersink bit on your drill. This way, the screws will not interfere with the countertop. And now you'll have a nice flat flush surface to attach to your base cabinet frame. Use your dummy wood we measured earlier to cut your countertop to the exact perfect length. Using a straight edge on one end, just measure and mark exactly where that dummy wood hits. Then you can use a carpenter square to extend that line to the other side of the countertop. To prevent tear out where the blade comes up and tears some of the wood fibers away, we've added some duct tape across the top of our countertop. Then use your table saw to cut the straight edge, making sure to account for the thickness of the blade. Now we've assembled our countertop, we're ready to finish and install it. The easiest way to sand the top and the edges of your countertop is with a belt sander. Just make sure that you are moving the sander with the grain of the wood and not against it. To prevent bruising the wall when you're installing your countertop, you can use a hand planer and just gently plane down the edges and the corners so they're no longer sharp. We'll do the same thing and sand the edges on the front where there's going to be an overhang. You want to sand the top and the bottom. However, you'll need to consider if you're doing a corner countertop, whether or not you want the edges rounded or if you would like where the two sides meet to be perfectly flush and join. We decided to sand ours to avoid sharp corners and we love the look. After sanding, we use fine steel wool to make the surface even smoother and softer. And now for the moment of truth, time to install your countertop. Very slowly and gently slide the countertop in, making sure it's square to the edges. And don't worry if it seems like it's not going to fit, we're going to show you a trick to magically expand your walls. Slide the countertop gently in, and if it doesn't easily push in, and you're left with a gap like we were here, then we're simply going to place pieces of wood on either side of your walls and use a clamp to expand the walls slightly. This will magically make your walls spread apart ever so slightly, just enough that you can gently push your countertop in flat against the wall, or at least close enough that you can cover the gap with a bead of silicone or with your tile if you're going to be tiling your wall. You've already plain jointed and prepared your wood. Now it's time to biscuit joint. There's a few more joints on this side of the countertop than the other, but it's exactly the same process. Gluing your boards together is also the exact same process using the biscuit joints, ensuring glue is on all of the surfaces. The easiest way we find is to stack the boards on top of one another and have someone else there to assist you. You can go up to four or five boards and be able to hold them sturdily. And then once they're glued together, simply lay them flat, glue the other side, and then add them together. Tighten your clamps underneath to squeeze the boards together. A little trick we like to use in order to make sure that our wood pieces are perfectly lined up is to use a clamp. Line them up over each of the joints, tighten the clamp, and then loosen the clamp. This helps squeeze the boards together and make sure that they are perfectly aligned. Just like with the left side of the cabinet, we'll place our calls and then our cabinet clamps. Because there's so many joints on this side of the countertop, we like to also use a clamp to ensure that the joints between the boards are aligned on the top and the bottom. Just take a clamp over the joint, squeeze it from the top to the bottom, and then release it, ensuring that each of the joints is lined up. We'll leave some of the clamps on on some of the trouble areas. And now you can see that the board is completely straight and flat. In order to cut this side of the countertop to have straight edges, we needed to use a circular saw to create an edge on one side that was square, and then the table saw to cut the other. It's always more appealing to have both sides of the countertop have the same type of grain exposed on the front edge. As of right now, the right side of our countertop has end grain exposed, 
but we want it to have edge grain, which is nice and smooth and will make the countertop look like it's way thicker than it is. So all we need to do is to add a piece to the front of the right countertop so that the edge grain is exposed. This is where we're going to use that extra piece that we cut from the left side. The width of this piece is going to be at least the width of our desired overhang, but we decided to double that to give it a two inch piece and make it look a little more appealing to the eye. Then we're simply going to biscuit joint this piece onto our right side of our countertop, creating holes the same as before about every foot or so, and then glue them together with the biscuits in the exact same way we have while making the countertops. Then clamp as before, remove the excess glue, Use any wood filler if needed, and when the clamp time is over, scrape the excess glue and sand with the belt sander on the top and edges. Then use your table saw to cut it to the exact width of the countertop. Next, we add on the faux front and the stabilizing pieces to the underside of the countertop. In this drawing, you can see the extra piece that we added where the purple arrow is was the two inches in depth. Then our faux front piece is one inch and this is our desired overhang. So this will give the look that the countertop is actually one and a half inches thick. In the same way as we did the left side, we secure those extra stabilizing pieces and the faux front. Make sure to measure the actual finished measurement now that the left side of the countertop is in before cutting the right side to its final dimensions. The same as on the left side, use your hand planer and your sandpaper and just soften up all those edges and corners. We're finally ready to install the right hand side of the countertop to slide it in on an angle with the left side going in first. You're most likely going to find that it doesn't fit perfectly again. So once again, you can use our trick with the clamp and the extra wood so that you don't bruise the walls and then just gently open it up. However, it may not still fit perfectly. So one of our top tips is to use a hand plane to shave off just a little bit of that edge or a little shim. You could see we added a wood shim there to level it out and then it will slide perfectly back in. Because of all of our planning, securing the countertop is a breeze. Just pre-trill holes between the base cabinet frame and the extra stabilizing pieces that we added. Just ensure that your screws will not go too deep that they'll go into the countertop. Having someone stand on top of the countertop really helps to just hold things in place. Just make sure not to drill into anyone's feet. Now it's time to protect that beautiful countertop you've built. So apply the first coat immediately after you secure it. Our favorite finish is the Osmo Polyx Matte Finish. Just remember the glossier the finish, the more water protection the stain will provide. Here you can see that even a natural finish will darken and deepen the color of the finished wood. To apply the stain, we're going to use this little red scrubby sponge, some paper towel, baby wipes, of course gloves for protection, and a mask. The first coat seals the wood and protects it from water damage, so we're going to use this Osmo Pollux Oil, which is a mix of oil and wax and is an excellent protector. We're going to apply these in the exact same way as the second coat, so I'm going to jump ahead and show you how I applied the second coat, which was a grey stain with another oil wax base from Osmo, and it helps to neutralize the yellow in the wood, which I really love. To apply the stain and also to apply the clear coat, we're going to use the little red scrubby and just scrub it right into the grain of the wood, making sure to always follow the direction of the grain. Be careful not to go too close to the edge with the scrubby or it will get all over your walls. But that's why we have the baby wipes handy, just in case. Almost immediately after you apply the stain, just wipe it off gently with your paper towel. Depending on how much of the gray you want to show in the grain, you can either wipe most of it off or just a little of it off. It's totally up to you. We just wanted a little bit of the gray to just neutralize the yellow tones in the wood. Immediately wipe off any spills on your wall or tile with a baby wipe. Here you can see that after applying one coat of the neutral stain and one of the gray, there's just a slight difference on the right side, a little bit less yellowing. You can add as many coats as you like of the colored stain in order to change completely the finished look of your countertop. They even have white stains if you'd like to have a little bit of a white finish. 
Just remember to follow the manufacturer's directions for the recoating times. To finish, we recommend that you apply three to four coats of the Pollux oil in order to protect your countertop from any water spills or food damage. If you've applied a gray or any other colored stain, we recommend just using a paper towel to apply and immediately wipe off this final coat. This way you won't be scraping off any of the stain that you worked so hard to add on. This stain goes really far, so just add a little at a time. And that's it, you're finished. We're done building our beautiful wooden countertop and it will look absolutely stunning in any space. And now we're moving on to our final step in building a base cabinet. Coming up next, we're going to show you how we built, installed and finished our beautiful wooden sliding drawers. Thanks for joining us in building our beautiful wooden countertop. We hope to see you next time. Please like and subscribe to our channel to find out when our next video comes out. I'd like to acknowledge the amazing help from my father-in-law Brent.